Hello and welcome to another exciting lecture for research methods. In this we're going to extend experimental designs to within subjects designs. So for this we've got the learning objectives of looking at what is within group design, so comparing and contrasting independent groups with within group designs. Then we'll look at explaining concurrent measures designs, repeated measures designs, then we'll look at internal validity, so we'll examine the threats to internal validity with in within subject designs, as well as describing the time-related effects and ways to minimize the time-related effects, because those are going to be the things that are going to challenge internal validity. Then we'll look at the advantages and disadvantages of within subjects design, so you should be able to analyze those. And finally, explaining the match subjects design, which is kind of a little bit, it's still a within groups design, but it's a different type of within groups design. So getting right into it with that first learning objective, compare and contrast independent groups and within groups designs. So uh, now we've got this, we talked about independent groups in that last one, but now what is not the main difference between independent groups and within groups? Well, again, as we've said before, in order to make the strong test of causal claims, researchers must carefully design their experiments. And one of the most fundamental design, design decisions is whether to use independent groups between participants, like we talked about last week, or within groups, often called repeated measures, but there's actually various different within groups designs. So you recall independent, get this to click, independent groups design is different groups of participants. So let's say you've got two treatment conditions, you're giving drug A and drug B, you give different groups that have no pairing mechanism, no matching at all between the two different groups, you give different groups um, the each drug treatment. So there's no way to do a parallel between any one participant in the first group and any one participant in the second group. That is one of the the big things that needs to be considered there is there is no direct parallel between any individual participant in one group and any individual participant in another group you're still drawing parallels between group one and group two but with within those groups there's not a direct linkage for individual participants so we're as the contrast is within groups design um, there's different types of this. One of the main types, and that's the one seen here, is repeated. But within groups design, um, even beyond what it says on this slide, within groups design is talking about when you have some parallel between a participant in one condition and a participant in another condition. It might be like with this example, where each participant is presented with all levels of the independent variable, that matching or pairing mechanism is the same individual. So the same individual gets drug A as drug B. So within our samples, within drug A and drug B, we can match someone with, uh, with a specific result from drug A and a specific result from drug B. And as I said, one way to do that is by just giving the same participants both drugs. So you can match them that way. Uh, so our independent groups, another example is each participant is randomly assigned to the red, green, or black ink group. Um, so there's only two types, pre-test and post-test. Whereas within groups, if you conducted the same experiment, each participant would use red, green, red ink, green ink, and black ink. And their performance would be tested after each ink exposure. So you've got the same participants across there. And we're going to talk about a couple different but this is that first one, um, repeated uh, measures. Another one we're going to talk about um, is uh, a different type where you're looking at having a logical pairing mechanism. So you call this paired samples. So you've got different uh, pairing mechanism between them. Let's say you've got twins 
all of your participants are sets of twins and you give one twin drug A and one twin drug B and then you measure the outcome. So your pairing mechanism there is the twins. But there's also a third type and that's matched samples. Now when I teach stats, I teach these as the same thing. So when we get to that in stats, or when you get to that in stats, you'll see that these are often called the same thing, paired samples and matched samples. However, when we look at it strictly from a methods perspective, there is actually a difference between the two. The reason you they're um, combined in stats is because you use the same formula, whether you've got paired samples or matched samples, it doesn't matter which one you have, you use the exact same formula, the exact same theory goes into them. But paired samples is when we had that pairing mechanism. Match samples is where we'll take and find something specific to what we're testing. Let's say we're looking at personality and something with personality. And we will match a participant from the first group to a participant from the second group based on that third variable like personality. We'll have our participants take personality tests and we'll take the two people that are the most extroverted. Let's say we're interested in extroversion. We'll take the two people that are most extroverted, the one person from each group, the one person from drug A and the one person from drug B who's most extroverted, and we match them together. And then we take the second most extroverted person from each group and match those together. And essentially we're creating a pairing mechanism that is that extroversion in this case, but we're doing it in a way that isn't as solid or concrete as paired samples, we're doing it in a way and we're, we're just matching them based on some third thing. We'll come back to that, but those are the, these are the are three types of within groups designs that we're going to look at. Um, so when we're talking about things like internal validity with our win, within groups design, we're looking at, and, and we'll go back to talking about this a little bit more when we look at threats to internal validity, but right now we're looking at it as an overview. Um, the, the general characteristics of within groups design is, and we're talking about the, the repeated measures, is that a single group of participants um, tests or observes each individual in all of the different treatment conditions. So one person, it's treatment condition one. They get treatment, then they're measured. Then they get treatment condition two, then they're measured. Then they get treatment condition three, then they're measured. So basically what's going on here is they're getting uh, each treatment condition and then being and then being measured on it. So the same group of individuals participates in every level of the independent variable. It's called repeated measures design and um, study repeats measurement of the same individuals under different conditions. Now, one thing we're going to look at here is this causes a lot of issues. This causes a lot of problems with internal validity. And we'll come back to that when we talk about internal validity with, I believe it's the fourth, learn, fourth and fifth learning objective are gonna look at the problems that can arise with this specific design. Let's before that get into the second learning objective and explain concurrent measures design. And in this, um, what is going on is participants are exposed to all levels of the independent variable and a single preference becomes the dependent variable. So what you're looking at is something like where Alexander showed infants that were three to eight months old, a doll in a truck side by side for 10 second trials in a puppet theater. They measured the infant's visual preference with an eye tracker. In this case, um, girls looked more at the doll, boys actually didn't show a preference. But the point here is is all levels of the independent variable. In this case, one level was the DAO, one level was the truck. All levels are, are happen at the same time. And the preference for one or the other becomes our dependent variable. 
So this is a special type of within groups design where participants are just exposed to all levels of the independent variable at the same time. And the one that they prefer, the one that they go for, the one that they reach for, the one that they think about, the one that they maybe even give just a general opinion preference on, all of that is the dependent variable. So that's concurrent measures design. There isn't much we're going to talk about that, but it is one design me method that's out there. The main one that we're looking at here before we go back to paired samples and matched samples design is repeated measures design. So it's a type of within groups design in which participants are, met, are exposed on one independent variable, then they're measured on the dependent variable, then they're exposed to another independent variable level of the independent variable, then they are measured on the dependent variable again. So uh, instance here, the example we've got here is in one group, they interact with their own toddler, then oxytocin is measured, then they interact with a new toddler, then oxytocin is measured. So in this case, when they were looking at oxytocin and social bondings, mothers interacted with their own toddler, and then they were measured, then they interacted with another toddler that wasn't theirs, and they were measured. And it was found that oxytocin levels were higher when women were interacting with the new child than with their own toddler. However, we've got a question here, and this is going to get to our threats to internal validity. Is it the new toddler here that resulted in the higher levels of testosterone, or was it a carryover effect from the first measure and it didn't come down enough. And then when the second measure, they were already started high and they ended up higher because of that, which that gets us to our threats to internal validity because now we've got concerns about if we're actually measuring what we, we say we're measuring or we're, we're having errors because of our design methods. So we get to our, our threats. First is confounding variables from the environment. And this is where environmental factors may change from one treatment condition to another. If you give people drug A in the morning and drug B in the evening, it could be that there's a diurnal effect, a, basically a time effect, time during the day that actually affects what it is you're talking about. So it could be a diurnal effect is what is causing the, the change, an environmental effect. And there's all kinds of effects that can happen like this. If you give the participants the, the drug in different rooms, it could be like that. But now we get into what is even more relevant, and that is time-related variables. Uh, so between the first measurement and the final measurement, parent uh, participants may be influenced by many factors other than the treatment. Could be a history factor. Something in, the hist in history is has caused them to, to have an effect here. It could be a maturation factor. They could have, um, if you, especially if you're measuring like weeks or months apart, they, something could have changed maturation wise. It could be an instrumental issue because just time changes, instrument changes. It could be a regression towards the mean. What is regression towards the mean? Regression towards the mean is when you, over time, people are going to get more average on things. This is why when you look at baseball batting average, if you know anything about baseball batting average, at the beginning of the season, some people have some really high batting averages. Some people have some really low batting averages. But by the end of the season, most people's batting averages average out. They get pretty standard in the center. Yes, there's still variants, but they're much more towards, the, the, towards each other than they started. That's what's referred to as regression towards the mean. And then finally, and this is the big one, and this is order effects. What do I mean by this? I mean the same thing I was saying on the previous slide when we were talking about oxytocin. Uh, it could be that the levels were there from earlier carried over, carryover effects, to the second measurement. So that's a big one, carryover effects. 
It could be that after the person has done one, two, three trials, by the time they're up to their last trial, let's say there's four levels of the independent variable, and they've done the first three levels and they've done the same task, by the end they're, for, they're fatigued, they're tired. So they're not going to do as well just because of fatigue. And then another big one is practice, especially if our dependent variable is something that you can get better at over time. So they take their first level of the independent variable, they're measured on the dependent variable, now they've they've had a little bit of practice at it. They take the second level of the independent variable, they're probably going to do a little bit better, but now they've had even more practice on the dependent variable. And they get to the third and final level of the independent variable and they've got a bunch of practice. They do better simply because they've practiced at it. So this gets us to the order effects or time related effects and how do we minimize those so those order effects i was just talking about that is where um the within groups design it, it might not be the fact that you've got the different levels of the independent variable that are causing the effect but the order in which the conditions were experienced so order effects are a huge threat to internal validity we talked about some of these like the practice effect so the practice effect occurs in which participants either get better at a task from practice or sometimes get worse at a task due to practice, like fatigue. So fatigue effects there happen. And for instance, once someone's done an anagram after receiving red ink cover booklet, they'll probably do better on the next set of anagrams regardless of ink color. And then the other type that we just talked about is the carryover effects. And this occurs when there's a contamination or residual carrying over from one to another. If you drink a caffeinated coffee and then take a test, then you drink a decaf coffee and take a test, well, you've still got caffeine in your system. So that isn't a good measure for it. So what do we do about this? Before we get to what do we do about it, let's look at another example where order effects produce changes in scores not caused by the treatment. Um, this is what I just explained. Um, we've got the original scores, um, no order effect, and then the original scores after treatment two with no order effect, you see that there's really no change here. You've got mean 20 to mean 20. But um, let's say there is an order effect. Well, this order effect, it might add five to each one. So in a sense, your mean changes just because of the order. And in this case, order effects vary systematically within, within the treatment conditions. And it, it's going to always contribute to the second and third and fourth to subsequent conditions, but never to the first. And it's always going to affect the later ones equally. So how do we deal with this? How do we deal with time-related threats and order effects? Well, we can control time. So if we've got a time-related threat such as history or maturation, um then we reduce the amount of time between them if it is something that the longer time goes on that that the more the greater the effect of history or maturation is going to occur then we can shorten the time between treatments um it increases the likelihood that order effects will influence the results but um it decreases the, the effects of history or maturation. So increasing the time between treatments increases the risk of time-related threats to internal validity. So when we look at these here, we're increasing the risk by increasing the time. But by shortening the time, we're doing the other. We're increasing the likelihood of the practice fatigue and carryover effects. So practice, and fatigue, practice fatigue and carryover effects are increased if we shorten the time between them, but by shortening the time between them, we reduce our history and maturation effects. So we're doing a little bit of both here. So uh, we can control it to an extent, but we have to have this balancing act. We can't shorten our time enough that these come into play 
So we have to shorten it enough to at least eliminate most of these while still not having these. Another option is to, to switch to between subjects design, um, especially if you know that order effects are something that's going to happen. That is a very good thing to um, have a between subjects design. If you know that just two trials is going to lead to fatigue, boredom, or strong practice effects, then you may want to just have between subjects. You may not want to do within subjects there. However, let's say these two trials isn't going to lead to fatigue or boredom, at least not that much. Might be a little bit of fatigue, might be a little bit of boredom, might be a little bit of practice. A little bit in there, a little bit, but what can you do then to, to control? You can't control time too much. You get too close together, well then you've got these carryover effects. This fatigue, boredom, practice, they, they are more present when you shorten the time. Well, one thing you can do if you want to do within subjects is what's called counterbalancing. Counterbalancing is where you change the order in which the treatment conditions are applied from one participant to another. So, for instance, half of let's say you've got two conditions. You've got drug A and drug B. We've only got two levels of the independent variable. Two levels of the independent variable are drug A and drug B. Um, and you basically take 50% of participants do drug A first, first and second. We'll do drug A first and drug B second. Then the other 50% We'll do drug B first and drug A second. So now you are controlling for the practice effects. You're controlling for fatigue effects. You're controlling for carryover effects. Why? Because in all of these conditions, we have 50% doing it one way, 50% doing it the other, meaning any practice, fatigue, boredom, uh, carryover, all of that that's occurring is going to occur half of the time to B and half of the time to A. So by this counterbalancing, you can essentially now look at the changes in it. You can control for that systematic change. Now, I've been talking about carryover effects, specifically like example when you've taken a drug and some of it's still in your system. That is one even counterbalancing isn't great for. That is one you should increase the time enough such that um, you are uh, you are getting rid of that carryover effect. But especially for practice conditions, boredom conditions, fatigue conditions, stuff like that, those work really well with counterbalancing. You should still do counterbalancing even with um, even if you wait, let's say days because then counterbalancing will counterbalance the other effects like history and matura maturation. So counterbalancing a within subject design prevents order effects from accumulating in one condition or another because the order effects, it, it spreads them evenly along the different conditions. It allows then for a comparison between treatments that is now putting the order effects on all conditions rather than just on one condition or on any condition that's not the first condition. It's important to note that this does not eliminate order effects. It just puts the order effects instead of if you just do A then B, order effects are only on B. But if you do A then B for half and B then A for half, then the order effects are applying to both A and B. There are some limitations to counterbalancing because it does not eliminate order effects it can show treatments that aren't actually as effective as we would like to believe or sometimes it 
shows treatments that are less effective than they actually are if it's due to things like fatigue or boredom. And so what ends up happening is, is the order effects are applied to some subjects within each treatment condition, even if they're applied to all treatment conditions equally, and they're applied to all participants equally, some treatment conditions within an individual are having order effects and some are not. And if, for instance, you've got an asymmetrical order effect, the order of treatments does not balance the order effects. Let's say you are doing that caffeine example. And in one condition, you drink decaffeinated coffee. So one group do, does decaf, then calf, and the other group does calf, then decaf. Well, the order effects is not going to occur from decaf to caffeinated because you're not going to have caffeine in your system before. However, especially if your time is short enough between them, the caffeinated to decaf will have an order effect. So an order effect will occur here, but not here. So it'll have a asymmetrical order effect. So when you're designing experiments, you have to be aware of order effects and you have to be aware of what order effects are asymmetrical or not. And then you have to do counterbalancing as a result. Now, you can take this um, order of treatments when it doesn't balance the order effects here and do them, let's say, one day apart. Now you've extended the time between them. Now there isn't an order effect on either. But there are other instances out there where even having more time between them isn't going to result in that. So another thing that, that it needs to be talked about is that complete counterbalancing requires presenting the treatment every possible sequence. To this point, we've been talking about A and B. And counterbalancing requires A, then B, and B, then A. But what about um, you've got multiple, 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 multiple. Let's say we've got A, B, C, and D. Well, now we have to do A, B, C, D. If we were doing it truly, I got to watch space. A to C to B to D. A to B to D to C, A to C to D to B, A to D to B to C, A to D to C to B. And now I've exhausted all of the instances where A is first, but now I have to do six more conditions where B is first. And then I have to do six more conditions where C is first. And then I have to do six more orders where D is first. And I'm left with 24 total orders. Whereas up here, we only had two. And let's say I want 50 participants in each order. Well, now I need 1,200 participants. So full counterbalancing is something that is easy with two treatments, really complex with more. Instead, we'll do partial counterbalancing where each treatment condition will occur first in sequence for one group, occur second for another group, and et cetera, and on. So you've got the A to B to C to D, but you've also got a B to C to D to A, a C to D to A to B, a D to A to B to C. So they're all happening in the same order still, but each group starts with a different point in the order. This is okay when you're talking about um, some fatigue effects and some practice effects. Uh, it gets less okay if there's uh, part if there's asymmetrical order and let's say A to B causes a bigger change than C to D. Well, then you're going to have this one causing a bigger, this one causing a bigger, this one causing a bigger, but there is no A to B in the last group. 
so they don't get as big of an effect of order so because of that it's not something that is uh, always going to be effective this gets us to learning objective six which is analyze the advantages and disadvantages of within groups design so looking at this um, in general Within groups, we can use fewer participants than between groups. Uh, if you have to have 50 participants for each group and you've got four groups, well, you've got to get 200 participants in between groups subject design. However, within groups, you could do it with 50. However, you still have to be cognizant of the fact that you those order effects and balancing and counterbalancing are going to be something you have to be concerned with. It does eliminate the problem of individual differences. Since there's no individual differences between the groups, there's only one group of participants, then any differences that are present are going to be due to the treatment or order effects, but they're either going to be the treatment not due to individual differences between the groups found in the study. If you're looking at something that maybe age affects and you do random groups, and you just happen to end up with a whole bunch of older people in one group and younger people in the other group, well, that is something that can affect your treatment condition. But if you're doing a within, that's what the, for a between groups design. If you're doing a within groups design, you're going to have the same age of participants in both groups because again, you've got that, the same conditions are being applied to both. And because of this, researchers have more power to detect differences between conditions. Statistical power, something that basically says how good the test is, how good your study is, how strong your study is, how strong your test is. Statistical power is stronger or higher with a within groups design than it is in a between groups design because participants are essentially serving as their own control. Um, any unsystematic variability, any error that's due to the, the different groups is eliminated because the same participants are in both groups. And it also reduces variance, which increases the chances of detecting a treatment effect. So if you can do a between groups design, you want to do a between groups design. It's a better test overall, if you have a logical reason for doing or a, or a logical way to do it. However, there are some disadvantages of within groups designs. They're sometimes not practical or possible. A new method that teaches children how to ride a bike. Um, once you've taught a child how to ride a bike, they know how to ride a bike. You can't test them on the new method than the old method or the old method than the new method because practice effects are so strong here that you're not going to find an effect of your second group because they, the, they've already learned it. They've already learned whatever it is. Um, if you're doing, uh, let's say you're doing a study and you're in the same day and you want to see if eating one thing or eating another um, affects their, how much they eat, whether one thing is in front of them or another affects how much they eat. Well, if you put chicken wings in front of them first and they eat all the chicken wings they can until they're not hungry, and then 15 minutes later you put a different food in front of them, of course they're not going to eat much of it or as much as they did the chicken wings because they're already full. If you do this a day apart and they come in at the same hunger level each time, then you can do that. Each participant usually goes through the series of treatment conditions. Often with treatments administered at different times, this can really lead to time-related factors which influence subject scores. Um, as I just said, what about this chicken wing example? What if you do them a day apart? Well, you do them a day apart and before they came in the first day, they had eaten something. Before they come in the second day, because they know they're going to get fed, they don't eat anything that day. They know they're going to get as much food as they can, so they don't eat anything that day, so they're way hunger. So time-related factors can influence it. Another thing that can come up, especially if you've got the between treatments as longer apart, attrition can occur. Some subjects will start the study, will drop out before it's conducted or before it's completed. So if you're giving them drug A one week and drug B the second week, some of your participants won't come back for drug B. And experimental demand or demand characteristics occur when a participant's pick up cues that lead them to guess the experimental hypotheses. 
Um, for example, um, in in an example we've used a few times here, but it goes back to that chicken wings. Once people have their tables bus, they'll find it strange if it stops happening in the second phase of the study and may become suspicious. If you're trying to see if people will eat more chicken wings when their tables are bust or not, well, if their tables are getting bust early on and then all of a sudden stop getting bust, stop getting cleaned up, then they might become suspicious. And this can happen if you've got multiple treatment conditions that the same participants are getting over and over again. Well, those same participants can start to um, guess what the hypothesis, uh, hypotheses are. By guessing what the hypotheses are, if there's deception, now they're going to change their behavior as a result. So when you're choosing, the, the advantage of within and between subject design are essentially the same as the disadvantages for the other. So if you've got large um, disadvantages of one design and that's going to affect your study, maybe you should do the other design. If you've got large disadvantages of the other design, maybe you should do the first. If you've, if your within subjects design has some pretty big disadvantages of doing it, then do between subjects. If your between subjects has big disadvantages of doing it, then do within subjects. Um, three factors that differentiate the designs, individual differences, time-related factors in an order of effects, and fewer participants. If you know that individual differences are not going to affect your study, and you know that time-related factors and order effects are would affect your study, and you've got a lot of participants, then do uh, with do between subjects. However, if you notice that individual differences will affect your study, you've only got access to fewer participants, and time-related factors do not as, as much affect it then do a, a within subjects design. This gets us to those other two types of designs that I talked about, and that is paired samples and matched samples. Now, I'm not going to talk about paired samples directly, um, but just note that paired samples designs are designs where um, you have a pairing mechanism, such as like if you've got husbands and wives, you put husbands in one condition, wives in the other. You've got twins, you put one twin in one condition, one in another. Stuff like that. Match subject design, though, is a little bit more complicated than that. And this is still where you were just like that. I was just saying with the paired, you're using a different separate group of participants for each treatment condition. So just like the between groups. However, each individual in one group is matched one-on-one -on -one to an individual in another group. They're matched typically based on a variable that's particularly relevant to the specific study. So the example that I gave earlier is, let's say extroversion is really relevant to our specific study, then we'll measure the, we'll take and measure extroversion on everyone, and the highest person, person with extroversion in group A gets matched with the highest in group B. Let's say age is something we know as a factor then we'll make sure that someone from condition A or in group A and someone from group B, they're the same age and we match them. So we'll recruit participants and we'll find, let's say we get 100 participants show up. We'll take and do the two oldest and put one of them into each. The next two oldest, put one of them into each. The next two oldest, put one of them into each. So there is a matching or pairing mechanism. So they're matched based on that. Its goal is to duplicate the advantages of the within subjects and between, between subjects design without the disadvantages of either one. So we're eliminating the between group differences by matching them, but we're getting rid of things like practice effects and fatigue effects by not giving everybody the same condition over and over again. And then the final thing to look at here is the stats that's used on within subjects design. And it's, again, it's very similar to the between subjects design. We've got a two, two treatment design um, where we evaluate differences between the two treatment conditions. Um, we can do, if there's more than two groups, we can do a, uh, a ANOVA. We can do a single factor ANOVA. Um, we can do a, a repeated measures t-test or a paired samples t-test. And 
Interestingly enough, these repeated measure t-test, paired samples, t-test, same thing, same exact test, they operate the same as a single sample test. That's why we're able to have more statistical power with them. If you've got an ordinal scale, you can use the Wilcoxon sign rank test or the sign test. Um, these are two non-parametric tests that you can use, um, and they basically look at paired data. All right, relatively short lecture. We looked at comparing and contrasting independent groups and within groups design. We then looked at explaining the concurrent measures design, explaining the repeated measures design. We talked about internal validity, so examine threats to internal validity within, in within subjects design and looked at the time-related effects and how to minimize those. And then looked at the advantages and disadvantages of within subjects design, looked at how the advantages of Within subjects are the disadvantages of between subjects, and yeah, vice versa is true. The disadvantages of within subjects is the advantages of between subjects. And finally, explained match subject design and briefly talked about paired samples design. So, thanks. Come on back.